everybody. Welcome to the uh, Bending Ironic for Big Iron session. Um, I'm going to start the session. Uh, my name is Kate Cahey. I lead a project called Chameleon, which is an experimental test bed for computer science. I'm from University of Chicago and Argonne National Lab. Argonne National Lab uh, is the, uh, the, the place where you find the fifth fastest supercomputer in the world. And that's our old supercomputer. We're building a new one, so definitely a big iron type of place. Um, my uh, associates, uh, Cody Hammock here and Jonathan Pastor, uh, work on the Chameleon project. Pierre Rito, who's our DevOps uh, lead, unfortunately could not be here today. Uh, he's getting married instead. For some reason, he thought that was uh, preferable. Uh, anyhow, Chameleon is, like I said, uh, an experimental test bed for computer science. It's led out of University of, of, of Chicago. TAC is uh, our partner. Uh, I, I understand you uh, heard a lot about TAC. We've got three more partners from UTSA Northwestern and OSU. Uh, it's an NSF-funded project that started in the fall uh, 2014. Uh, we built the testbed and uh, took it public at the end of July last year. Since then, we've had 700 users, 180 uh, very exciting cloud research projects. Now, what we were trying to do with Chameleon is two primary things. One, build a large-scale testbed, a uh, large-scale testbed for high-performance computing research and big data research. So we've got uh, 650 nodes five petabytes of storage to support big data experiments, uh, over two sites, TAC and University of Chicago, connected with a 100G network, and reconfigurable, deeply reconfigurable, because we, we support computer science experiments ranging from virtualization, containers, um, exascale operating systems, and so forth. So hence the name Chameleon, right? It's supposed to adapt itself to your needs. Uh, a quick word about Chameleon hardware. Uh, we primarily have racks of um, which we call standard cloud unit of uh, 42 compute nodes, which are Intel Haswell processors. Each rack also additionally has four nodes, which are also Intel Has Haswells. But each storage node has um, 16 two terabyte disks, right? So per rack, you've got 128 terabyte disk space with very fast IO bandwidth to that. Uh, in addition, each storage rack has uh, an SSD so that you can experiment with storage hierarchies, things of that kind. In addition to that, we've got uh, 3.6 petabytes uh, global storage because users told us that some users running experiments on big data, it takes a day to upload the data to the um, to the test bed. So we wanted to have a permanent home for that big data that they're experimenting with so that they don't, don't have to do that. Um, in addition, we're bringing in heterogeneous hardware. So all of that is homogeneous. We've got 10 of those racks at TAC to create large homogeneous partition, which is necessary for high performance computing experiments. Um, and in addition, we're adding now uh, GPUs, we're adding mo more SSDs, and eventually are going to have Atom microservers and ARM microservers. So these are, this is just hardware, just uh, more about that, uh, r really what, what I already said. And how is this testbed now configured to support computer science experiments where you go from resource discovery through provisioning, configuration, monitoring cycle? I'll tell more about that and more about how uh, we use OpenStack in a, in a talk today in the afternoon. Uh, but today we'll focus on what we do with configuration, how we use Ironic to configure bare metal resources. So um, as I said, we support all sorts of experiments that use that require very deep reconfiguration. Those are experiments in virtualization, containers, exascale operating systems, or all of the above at the same time. Um, and those users um, need bare metal reconfiguration. They need console access. In some cases, they need access to the BIOS and, and so forth. So we started out with, uh, when we built Chameleon, we started out with Juno um, Ironic, as uh, dictated by the date when the project started. And we started using the Pixie driver with uh, Deploy Ironic and, and using the partition images. This was very painful, very painful for us to install, but also extremely painful for our users because as you can imagine, with the kind of research they are doing, they very often need to boot from custom kernel. And so what they had to do in order to do that is recompile the kernel, upload it to Glance, deploy it by Ironic from Glance, and then rebuild it again and do the same thing. If they wanted to reboot with different kernel parameters, it, it was even more entertaining because they would have to compile those parameters, hardwire them into the kernel, and then do the same thing, upload to Glance, deploy from Glance. Right? So this was taking a very long time uh, they were not amused, and uh, we were looking for better ways of doing that. 
a couple months ago, we upgraded to Liberty and started looking at the tools in Liberty, uh, which you know has the a agent IPMI tool driver and the IPA image. Unfortunately, there was this extra dependence on Swift, and that was also not supporting partition images, which all of our users had, right? So if you have 700 users, each user has several images, and you now tell everybody switch to a completely different image format that does not make you very popular. So eventually we figured out that we could use the Pixie driver and IPA image, which supported both partition images and whole disk images. So now our, our uh, operating systems users uh, moved to the uh, whole disk images and loved us for that. And everybody else, and people doing research on security and resource management and all sorts of interesting um, other projects are still using partition images. So that worked, um, worked reasonably well for us. Things that we would like from Ironic for our use case. So the, the first and foremost, uh, a very important thing for us is the ability to attach cinder volumes to uh, bare metal images because those users that I mentioned earlier that experiment on big data, um, if they want to use that in their experiment, now you, know, you, you don't want to compile it into the image, certainly. Uh, you don't want to uh, be uploading it from an external uh, storage system either, right? So if they can, if they can uh, connect to a center volume, have all the data there, and also store the data that they produce, that would be fantastic. Uh, booting bare metal instances on certain center volumes would be great. It would allow us to deploy them faster. It would also uh, allow us not to snapshot them, but you know, since uh, essentially what it would mean that if something happens, if, if the user's control goes away, the image is already saved. So uh, that would be fantastic. Network isolation um, uh, using Neutron would be very important for us because in addition to operating systems user, we've got users working on uh, network functions. And for example, we've got users who want to run experiments on name-based networking and, and, and different types of networking in general. So we want them to be separate and isolated from each other so that your you know, standard IPv4 doesn't get uh, mixed up with name-based networking, right? Um, things that are maybe, maybe a little bit lower on the priority list, Console access via Horizon web interface. Cody here already has a solution for console access that some of our users are using. Our solution before that was them to email us and, and we would send them the output, which did not scale. Um, but it would be fantastic to have it via Horizon so that it is like KVM. And, and really, a lot of our wish list can be described as like KVM. Now, snapshotting, we've got something that we develop ourselves that works on command line. Uh, it would be fantastic to get that from OpenStack and again, um, get that via Horizon and, uh, and uh, make it easier for users. And that last uh, on the list is changing BIOS parameters. We do have users who need that, but with 700 users and uh, I don't know, nine months of operation at this point, we've had only two cases when they really needed to do that. And in those cases, we just did it for them and, and we were fine, right? But, but still, an important thing if you're doing um, a deeply reconfigurable computer science research. If you'd like to hear more about Chameleon and the ways we're using OpenStack in Chameleon, which ironic is probably one of the less innovative ways we're doing interesting things with advanced reservations and so forth, come to our talk today in the afternoon, MR18, uh, and or visit our website, always a good thing. And think about uh, working on your next research project on Chameleon as an infrastructure supporting uh, research experiments, right? We're open to everybody in academia, everybody in the labs, and everybody in industry who works with academia in the labs. So um, think about that. All right. Next person. One second. <laughs> Sorry about that. We need a uh, little tech support here. They were supposed to be up. Thank you. So uh, I'm Nathan Grodowitz from Oak Ridge National Labs. 
uh, we're here to talk a little bit about our work with Ironic and Docker. Um, so first off, I am the uh, head of clusters and parallel file systems for a project called CADES. Um, it's the Compute and Data Environment for Science. Uh, it consists of HPC resources, OpenStack cloud resources, specialized analytics, resources, and shared storage. Uh, we have many goals. Probably our main one, in, one of our main ones in my opinion, is that we have uh, support system technical knowledge, basically everything in place to create very complex workflows for our users that improve their time. Uh, so this is the, uh, the full view of CADES. This is exactly what um, it's all about. Basically an end-to-end -end solution for our users to get work done. These are some of our systems. Uh, as you can see, we have a, a very heterogeneous environment with lots of uh, hardware variation, uh, even down into like uh, specialized analytics machines. So currently, there are several HPC and cloud challenges that we have. Uh, as a user, we have VMs that are allocated for scientific u resources that end up staying up due to how our security has to work. Um, and so they don't really make much sense to have them running. Quite often there is an idle time for them. Um, these workflows also require complex environments that are really often un unsuited for general use systems like our HPC assets. Now, as an admin, we would really like to have HPC and cloud resources controlled. Uh, well, currently we have HPC and cloud resources controlled separately. We are working to bring that on to a single pane, uh, hopefully in a future release. Um, HPC resources are slow to deploy and update, despite their diskless nature. We have to go through manual config files, set everything up, reboot the nodes via IPMI. It, it is a uh, multi-step process that it should not be. Um, we also maintain large amount of computation VMs, and it's a high and it, that's a challenge because each one in becomes a pet rather than the cattle that we really want them to be. Um, so Ironic allows rapid deployment of our diskless systems. It allows us to roll back to previous versions very easily. Uh, and then we can just make changes through uh, OpenStack rather than making changes to all these config files mentioned before. Um, also, we can store, centrally store all of these images, which is a great way to uh, provide these to our customers. Um, and again, we want to put our VM and HPC resources under a single pane of glass. Uh, so we have some plans to take advantage of Docker. So for deployment, we want to rapidly deploy new workflow pieces uh, on our existing hardware. Basically, we're going to take our existing HPC nodes, put Docker on them, and schedule Docker containers on those nodes rather than actually scheduling uh, traditional batch jobs. Um, this will allow us to avoid having to create special Snowflake environments where they're doing like large processing. They can just they can make their own Docker containers and then run them on our HPC uh, assets. Um, so for administration, uh, we would really like to schedule Docker containers via orchestration rather than scheduling them via uh, current VMs being kept spun up. Also, we want to really make use of our current HPC resources that, ha that sometimes the queues are not filled up due to the fact that these queues are owned by specific users. Uh, when they're not queued up, we would like to just dump Docker containers out there and run them on the back end. Um, as well as we've been looking into possibly using Docker containers to do checkpointing so that we can have an admin level checkpoint rather than a user based checkpoint that traditional HPC pulls in. And so for that, bring it on to Blake, uh, Blake Caldwell. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. So Nathan mentioned a couple things about that are, well, things are specific to our environment. So the, uh, we want to take advantage of diskless booting. Um, so that's one aspect that we want to contribute to Ironic. And so um, next, I want to pictorially describe like our s the motivations why diskless booting is useful, um, and then actually how we um, how we went about implementing it. So start off with the you know the normal ironic boot process. So you might have an OpenStack administration, or an admin cluster, um, perhaps an ironic conductor, that's sending that the other nodes are pixie booting from sending the the init RAM disk um, and the VM Linux file out to the different nodes. For the second stage, that's where Typically, Ironic will send, um, will make an iSCSI connection, and over iSCSI will transfer the image. This QCOW2 image, um, for example, may be five gigabytes in size. So here, you need to send it out to each one of those different nodes. So an alternative would be to use NFS root, where you have an NFS server hosting a so-called golden um, image that all your containers boot from. And so at that second stage, after the node have, has Pixie booted, all the information about how to access that NFS server and mount its root volume 
is passed to the node, and the node can then transfer, um, transfer it um, you know, to booting from the NFS root partition. So from this point, you can see that you know, each of those nodes still needs to pull in, in image information, but it's not five gigabytes times n. It's a much smaller amount. It's just the files that are needed for boot. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is we want to manage these images um, in our um, traditional fashion, which has worked well. And so this, uh, this golden image here is just an, un, an untarred um, file system, really, that we can go in and make modifications to, reboot the nodes. It's a very convenient way for image, um, image management and change on the fly. So there's a problem, though. What if we want to actually deploy this on HPC cluster? So here's a, you know, a common HPC example. This is, just, this is three racks. They could have up to 240 nodes in them. Each one will run their own individual Linux, so those little tiny penguins there. Uh, those, so all those have to get you know, from the central point. And if you're trying to send them over iSCSI, um, well, you have 240 times 5, five gigabytes traversing your network all at once. So you can design your network around it, but we think there are better options that scale better. And NFS root is one example um, that we think is a good starting point. So how is this accomplished? So there are three steps here. So as mentioned, the images reside in an external NFS server. This is not integrated with Ironic in any fashion right now. This is existing infrastructure that we set up. It's not complicated. It's just an NFS server with different directories for each different image. And that image metadata, so the second part is that metadata for where to access the image, it needs to be passed to the node somehow. So one way of doing that is, so here's a patch that was, that's in review. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's based on the Liberty Code checkout, uh, where the image, the metadata for where to contact the NFS server is stored in Glance. So the advantage of that is that you don't have to have one global configuration for all your nodes. You can have one ironic conductor, which boots different nodes from different images just by, well, it boots a different image for each node just by specifying the pixie parameters within the Glance image. Um, so that's something, so work is in progress to move that to Mintaka um, and so forth and upstream. The third piece is a no-op deploy driver. And so this is something um, I'd like to you know, hear about Cray's implementation here but in a little bit. But uh, they faced a similar problem. We went about it, the, we went about distributing the file system in a different way. We wanted to distribute the, the actual um, file system interface, you know, POSIX interface rather than a block device. So um, what I just want to say here is that we can, um, we can work together to coalesce these into a single driver. Our approaches are very much compatible. So at this point, we're talking about booting a node. So this is useful. This is a node you could SSH into, but this is a standardized image. This is really like an useful, this is useful for admins. So now the second stage, how do we make it useful to the scientists who actually want to get work done? And this is where we can bring Docker in. In this scenario, we have a Lustre file system up top. We have the same 240 nodes at the bottom. And now we want to take this image. So this is the user environment that a, uh, a scientist might have um, created to actually you know, run his application in, um, test it elsewhere. But now, to be able to actually run it on these nodes, we can store that on a Lustre file system, so a parallel distributed file system, where each of these different nodes, just like NFS root, are just going to pull in the files it needs, or the um, parts of the block device. And so this is how this is the scenario I'm going to talk about in just a second, but this is, this is what we want to accomplish. So being able to use Docker to ca encapsulate the, uh, the image containing the actual application and distribute that to the nodes. So how this is actually accomplished, um, so up top is a host, um, and the bottom is a Lustre file system. So it's just an example of one image decomposed into three different layers. Each of those layers is a file on the file system. There's a Lustre mount from the file system, of course, to the host, but the host, this is, so this is a driver, um, it's a plugin to Docker. So it's a graph driver um, uh, plugin API that was introduced with the experimental release. Um, so we're hoping that will become um, part of the, uh, the next Docker release. But what this allows, um, all this to do is to mount those different files as a loopback device on the host. So in this example, we have three, um, three mount points. These are three ext4 mounts that reside in Lustre. And then we can use OverlayFS to merge those into a single union mount providing a unified um, perspective for the container, container to actually run its file system from. So down at the bottom is um, a work in progress implementation for that. Um, very much like to invite other people who are interested in this to uh, take a look at that, um, contribute, um, you know, let us know what uh, you know, different use cases they would, uh, would help out with. So with that, thank you very much, and I'd like to pass it on.
Okay, so hi, my name is Doug Chomsky. Um, I'm based in the Bristol office of Cray um, over in the UK, and I've got a few slides on um, how we use Ironic uh, at Cray. Uh, so first of all, why are we using OpenStack? Um, OpenStack uh, is the foundation of Cray's next generation system management software. Uh, so this means that we need to support um, two key use cases. And the first is um, booting large numbers of nodes uh, disklessly. And the second is um, flexibly provisioning uh, diskful nodes. Uh, so the first part of my talk um, will be focused on Cinder integration for Ironic, uh, similar to how Blake's already mentioned. And the second part will be about the Baryon agent for Ironic uh, for diskful provisioning. Uh, so just to give you a, an idea of the scale of some of the machines that we build, um, a typical uh, compute blade uh, contains four nodes, and in a cabinet you can have 48 blades, and these systems scale to hundreds of cabinets, so you can end up with tens of thousands of nodes. Um, our Cinder integration work uh, is based on an upstream spec uh, developed by Satoru, uh, Moria, and others. Um, this is still in review. And um, rather than making any changes to uh, uh, OpenStack APIs or uh, adding database tables, um, some of the things that I mentioned in the spec, we've configured our driver using the ironic instance info fields. Uh, so this is a fairly simple driver, um, and it supports um, booting disklessly from Cinder via iSCSI, so there's no support for fiber channel. And we use an inbound connection method uh, to attach to the iSCSI target. Um, we can attach additional volumes at boot time, um, but we don't support doing that dynamically. And um, we focused our work around uh, Drake up based RAM disks, um, although any RAM disk uh, should be compatible. And um, although um, we haven't uh, merged our driver, um, we've made it available um, uh, on this link if you're interested. Uh, so I won't go into this slide in detail. Um, but these will be available afterwards. And uh, so I'll just talk about uh, what happens here in a general scheme. So um, you start a diskless boot by um, calling Nova Boot um, with the boot volume parameter. And this boot volume parameter uh, contains an ID of a Cinder volume. Uh, Nova Compute um, then calls Cinder to set up the block device. And then the ironic vert driver um, which is part of Nova Compute, uh, patches that information down to Ironic through the Ironic API. So Ironic then has all the necessary information to connect uh, to the Cinder block device. Um, Ironic, uh, the Ironic conductor then boots the target node. Uh, the node loads the RAM disk and the, the um, kernel from the TFTP server. And um, eventually, in the RAM disk, the node uh, mounts the iSCSI target and pivots into the root file system. So the second part of my talk is on disk full provisioning. And um, at Cray, uh, we've used the Baryon agent, which was part of the Fuel project. And this project, uh, Baryon, um, it's mostly been developed by Mirantis, although there are other contributors, uh, and we are one of those. And it's really about um, operating system installation. Uh, so, in particular, we use the Baryon agent, which is part of the Baryon project. And this is quite similar to the Ironic Python agent. Uh, so, some of the reasons uh, why we've used Baryon, we've actually extended it uh, to support some of these uh, use cases. Um, we quite often have kind of non-cloud-like deployments. So, for example, um, booting multiple images uh, locally on a node. Um, supporting complex partitioning schemes. So uh, sharing partitions between uh, multiple images, um, LVM groups uh, targeting specific block devices by uh, serial number, for example. And um, we also, uh, we've made use of rsync, so we can mount um, all these various partitions and then just use rsync to copy the files across them seamlessly. Uh, so you don't need to have multiple images um, for multiple partitions. And um, uh, there is also support for running arbitrary actions uh, after the um, disk has been provisioned. Uh, so ag again, I won't go into details here, but 
the, the process is quite similar to uh, the diskless boot, um, except this time the RAM disk um, contains the baryon agent. Uh, so once the target node has been booted by the Ironic conductor, the baryon agent um, calls back to Ironic, and the Ironic um, driver at this stage it drops into the vendor interface and it's um, SFTPs across a provision script. Now, um, thi this uh, driver is really is driven by some JSON scripts. Uh, so you can see on the Nova um, boot command I've got up there in the top left, um, we're passing through a deployment config which contains the partitioning uh, scheme uh, for the node and any driver actions which you wish to complete afterwards. So um, the ironic driver copies across a script um, which tells the Baryon agent what it should do to the node. And then it SSHs into the node and uh, initiates the provisioning. So after the disks have been provisioned, um, the Baryon agent um, can do the post deploy actions, which could be, for example, copying over an SSH key. Uh, so in terms of scaling ironic, I thought I'd put a, a quick slide on this. We haven't actually got uh, very far here. Um, We've looked at uh, booting a 128 node system um, with our diskless boot driver. Um, to do that, we used um, a single cinder volume uh, using multi-attach and an overlay file system. Uh, we've looked at running multiple instances of Ironic, uh, so Ironic multi-conductor. And our focus point at the moment is to deploy OpenStack using Collar uh, so we can support, uh, support a highly available and a scalable um, OpenStack installation. And eventually, um, we hope to scale up to uh, this kind of uh, order of magnitude of nodes, 100,000 by sometime around 2018. So I'll now hand over to Tyler, who'll, who'll talk about testing. Great. Uh, so I'm Tyler Lastovich, and I'm here with Cray as well. And we just thought we'd give you guys a little bit of a background into how we came up with a test system to actually test some of this work, especially with the bare metal. All right, so what did we do? Uh, we created a test infrastructure to validate bare metal deployments and installations of OpenStack. Uh, and we were trying to do all of this in continuous integration. We really needed a way to validate the individual pieces that were going into the, the additions that we were making for both Cray products and OpenStack. So we really needed to get something seamless together. And there wasn't really much, especially when we started this project, to test bare metal. Uh, and so that was a big driver for it. So we used KVM uh, to back this test infrastructure. Um, and so what we did is we used a management node, essentially, that's a VM to run all of our OpenStack services. And we could attach that to either real, real or virtual, essentially bare metal nodes that were configured using uh, either the Ironic SSH driver. We installed all of our test suites using Ansible. And so those could be used or not used on the fly. And then we automated the entire process. So it could be run with one click. So the most important an interesting piece of this is uh, our virtualization of the management node. We used a virtual management network that we created and tore down uh, using Vagrant. Um, and those could be either attached to other slave VMs or actually to real bare metal nodes that we have on site. So for the virtual VMs, uh, we have a small number that we typically create. Uh, but you can use as many as you want. Tempest, you have to typically create a good number if you want to run parallel jobs. And so it allowed us to not keep real resources tied up for a long time. We could just spin up the slave VMs. And these are all created just by the vagrant up command as provisioning steps. We also used physical hardware, um, both diskless and diskful nodes. We wanted to test the provisioning across all three uh, styles. So this is probably a little hard to see on these screens, um, but this is just a, a diagram of the test process that we use. Uh, really the important parts here are that it's, you create the environment that has both virtual and real nodes, 
you install and configure your base OS, any OpenStack projects, uh, and we did all of that using Ansible. You can run all of your tests, which we are doing uh, bare metal deployment tests, Tempest testing, Rally testing, and heat stack creation testing. When that's finished, uh, we packaged up all the results um, and then sent notifications out to IRC, email, did kind of the system dumps, so all of that could be retrievable later. And we did all of this, uh, we automated it through Jenkins. Um, on the bottom diagram there, uh, there's the two little snapshot icons, uh, and that was important where in the middle while we were actually testing this, we took snapshots of these VMs so we could roll back to pre-configuration on the fly so we wouldn't have to rebuild these VMs and reinstall it all the time. So probably the most important to you guys is what would we do differently if we started over? Um, so first of all, we would skip Vagrant. Um, we found that it had quite a few concurrency issues and we had to kind of hack in a few patches on the fly during every test run. Um, it can be pretty fragile and hard to diagnose at times, especially when you're running on machines that are fairly heavily loaded. And we actually had to pin a version of it just to actually get it to work with how we needed it to do. So the next part would be kind of a, a perfect world situation where we want to keep all of our package installation fully modular. Um, that really would be a lot nicer for us where you could kind of look ahead to the future of what the community is doing and pull it in piece by piece. Uh, and kind of allow for more independent merge testing. I think that would be very good. And also, uh, we think that we could do this on OpenStack. So a project like Quintupolo would be really interesting to back instead of Vagrant, uh, where you could do all this bare metal virtualization actually in an OpenStack environment. I think that's it. Hi guys, well done. That was all very interesting. I had one question for you, which I was kind of interested if um, any of you'd like to answer, and that is, what do you do really about the users that you can't always trust? So if you're providing a cloud environment, uh, normally you can just, you know, they're well encapsulated within the bounds of their KVM environment. But if they have uh, root privilege on bare metal hardware, they can write the firmware, they can do all kinds of things. What do you do to counteract that? Right. So, <laughs> so, um, right. so, so we did um, vulnerability analysis uh, earlier on in the project, and you know, one one thing that we found is that actually a lot of the attacks were not that different from the kind of attacks that you're going to see when you're running virtual machines, right? And and as far as that goes. Uh, both TAC and University of Chicago, the machines are on isolated networks. Um, you know, all, all of that is, um, uh, all, all, all of those issues are, are worked out. The one issue that is not worked out is the one that I referred to in my talk, which is the isolated networks. So right now, if somebody runs on Chameleon, and for example, intentionally or unintentionally, runs something like DNS server, right? things could go haywire. This is why we're interested in, in isolating those networks and, uh, and making sure that this doesn't work. There's another principle that is at play, which is we're trying not to give users access, and you know I'm sure that it's porous in, in some respects, but we're trying not to give users access to anything that we cannot restore, right? So right now, we're not giving them access to BIOS, for example, because we haven't worked out yet what we're going to do by way of restoring that and, and, and the firmware and so forth. Um, the uh, uh, you know the the one thing that is interesting about this is that I think it's to some extent it's race against time, because the actual two um, um, security incidents that we did have since Chameleon started came from um, a pool of machines that were running as KVM, that were running as virtual machines. And in both cases, it happened because somebody downloaded a, a virtual machine image somewhere from the internet, forgot to change the admin password. And that, you know, that happened to us before running different infrastructures, and it's a, it's a relatively common occurrence, I would say. It doesn't happen with hardware images just because there aren't so many of them. Right, so so this is why I'm saying race against time. When, when this form of making resources available becomes more common, there will be more attacks. And 
we're working right now, we're working on the isolation network in networking and so forth to, to do something to prevent it. Anybody else wants to jump in? Go ahead. Um. <laughs> And uh, just to make it clear, when we're talking about doing the ironic stuff, we don't. We have no intention of giving users root level privilege on hardware. You uh, want a trusted OS image on your systems, or yes, when we're deploying uh, our images, those will be images that we have created. They will be specifically built. Uh, only in VMs will we allow users to have that sort of power, and even then, it will be somewhat limited. Thank you. I actually have one other question, which was um, that each of you is uh, pushing the boundaries of what Ironic can currently do in, in some way or other. How do you find working with the Ironic project members upstream? So I found the community, I mean, it's, it's a very receptive community. They want to hear use cases. They want to hear how Ironic's being used. Um, you know, they get, they get the public, I mean, the public cloud, like that's, that's a huge use case for it. So how you can provide bare metal as a service. Um, but I, you know, talking with them, they're excited about the HPC use case, and um, you know, they're very receptive to the idea of diskless boot. Um, and I think Cray's had good luck, luck pushing patches forward. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, thanks to them for you know keeping on with that um, that initiative. But you know, we need need more use cases, and um, you know, if you have use cases that don't fit ours, propose those to the ironic developers and. Um, you know, they're excellent for, you know, seeing how they can actually make those work. I'm actually going to refer this question to Cody because he's down there in the trenches working with that community. Yeah, uh, I guess unfortunately I don't have a whole lot of interaction with the Ironic development team. Uh, mostly uh, concentrating on the implementation side and, uh, and seeing what we can squeeze out of the current state of the, uh, the software. Any other questions?